takes a fair amount of effort to get the mind into right concentration. In fact, so much effort for a lot of us that we don't like to hear that that's all we have to do. Right concentration is the last factor of the path, but that doesn't mean you just stop with right concentration and everything is done. You have to bring the other factors of the path to bear on it. When the Buddha talks about right concentration and its seven requisites, part of the meaning is that you have to develop right view and right resolve and all the other right factors to get the mind into right concentration. But it also means that you apply them to right concentration, too, particularly to develop mindfulness and alertness and the right view that puts an end to all your defilements and actually gets you to the goal. You have to remember that when the Buddha gave his first Dharma talk, he, all he talked about was right view. He mentioned the eight factors of the path, but then he focused just on right view about suffering, its cause, its cessation, and the path to its cessation. And that was the factor that got Anyan Gondanya to experience the Dharma I. And we can assume that he followed through the other, with the other factors to get there, because after all the Buddha says you can't attain that first level of awakening without all factors of the path. But it does point to the fact that right view is really important. Sorry, Buddha is another case. It was given a very short verse, which consisted basically of the principles of right view, and there he was. Experience the deathless. Now we're not as sharp and as quick as either of those two. So we have to put a lot more work into getting the mind at concentration and then apply the principles of the other factors to that concentration to get those kinds of results. The Buddha talks about four different proper uses of concentration. It's called the four developments of concentration. And some people think that it's actually four different kinds of concentration, but when you look at where the Buddha talks about the concentration in the different parts of the, the canon, and the way these four uses are developed. It's all basically getting the mind into the four jhanas, any one of the four jhanas, and then working from there. The first one is to use the concentration as a pleasant abiding. In other words, you get there and you just stay there, settle in. And when we know that there are other things that you have to do with the concentration, some people get kind of antsy. They say, well, now I've got the mind to settle down. What's next? And it's important to say, well, this is what's next. Just keep on doing what you're doing so you get really familiar with it. And you can nourish the mind this way, because our minds come to the practice often in a very frazzled state. And the mind needs to be soothed. It needs to be strengthened. Remember, concentration, as the Buddha says, is like food. So feed your mind well. Because you need this food in order to stick with the practice as a whole. Your ability to tap into a sense of well-being inside is what makes it easier to follow the precepts, easier to pull yourself out of sensual attachments. Easier to do whatever is required. So the Buddha often says you settle in and you indulge in the the pleasure or the equanimity of that particular state of concentration. You learn to enjoy it. You find that it's something that you really delight in. You want to notice that, because that's going to be a factor that's going to come up later. As John Fuhn used to say, you have to be really crazy about the meditation in order to do it well. You have to like it. You have to be intrigued by the, the intricacies. Whatever gets in your way, you say, well, I want to figure some way around this. It's like someone who's really devoted to a sport and wants to figure out all the little problems and finds that they're really engaging. You want to have that kind of engagement with your, 
with your concentration. The second use for concentration is for developing psychic powers. Now this is something of the four, four uses. This is the optional one. And it's something that you can't determine ahead of time that you're going to get, develop this power or that power. They come. As the Buddha says, you get the mind in a concentration, and when there's an opening, you can develop this particular power. It might be ability to remember previous lives, ability to read other people's minds. A number of the Forest Johns are, are famous for these abilities. As John Fu said, John Lee had all of the abilities except the ability to levitate. It had a lot to do with his karma. And the karma is what determined whether the opening came or not. The important thing is, if the opening does come, you have to ask yourself, what's the best use of this? This is where you get into the other two uses. The first one is for mindfulness and alertness, to see how things arise and pass away. A concentrated mind is a really good one for that. Sometimes it's simply moving from one level of concentration to another. You notice, oh, something changed here. Your perception changed. A feeling changed. It changed from rapture to displeasure, or from pleasure to equanimity. As you get the mind in and out of concentration, it's good to be able to notice these things. Because you begin to notice how the perceptions and the feelings have an impact on your mind. They determine how you experience the breath, how you experience your body. So you want to be able to notice when they come, when they go, which particular perception is here, which one is gone. And then you begin to notice other things about them as well. When this perception is in your mind, what level of stress or disturbance is there in the mind? Is when the Buddha talks about what he calls the entry into emptiness. You start out with a very normal state of mind. You sit out here, we're surrounded by quiet right now. You think back, a while back you were at home, you were with family, with your friends. The mind was a lot more disturbed than now you're here. What's the difference? I mean, the issues that you had when you were with the family, the issues could be still dug up and you could still chew them over, but you don't. You've got another perception. You're here away from those things. They don't have the same importance they had. And the mind is a lot lighter. Right there you see the difference between the perception that okay, you're among these people and their issues are important, and when you're away from them, and their issues are not important. So the perceptions don't just come and go, they have an impact. You want to see that. So you get a sense of which perceptions are skillful and which ones are not in the coming and the going. This, the Buddha said, is what helps foster mindfulness and alertness. Then the final use of concentration goes deeper than that. He says you want to see the origination and passing away of the five aggregates, form, feeling, perception fabrications and consciousness. Now, on the surface, this may sound like the same sort of thing as developing mindfulness and alertness, but the word origination there is important. It's not just the fact that things come and go, but they come because of a reason. In particular, the reason is your delight. We delight in form. We take the potentials for form. We want form. We want to have this experience of the body. And so whatever potential there is to augment that experience and to verify it, we go for it. Turn it into an actual experience. The same with feelings. Perceptions. We want to have perceptions. We want to be able to label and identify things. And there's a certain delight in all of this. Where do you see that most clearly? You see it in your own state of concentration. Again, you're using Jhana. It's not a different kind of concentration from being in jhana. It's the same concentration, but you look at it from a different angle and with a different purpose. You're trying to find something that's even better than the jhana. And 
And so again, you apply perceptions that dig out the delight you find in the various aggregates as they make up the concentration, the form of the body, the feeling of pleasure, the perception that holds you with the breath, or with the space, or whatever the object may be. Whatever fabrications there may be around that, and the consciousness of all these things. You apply the perceptions of inconstancy, stress, not self. To question that delight you take in these things. Now, if your concentration isn't strong enough, you can just use this analysis and everything falls apart. But if the concentration is strong enough, you realize, okay, there must be something other than this. And it's a turning of the mind, not toward creating anything new, because you see that whatever activity you're going to create, it just ends up with more of these aggregates. How about something that's not created? Is that possible? And if things come together right, you find that, yes, it is. So of the different uses for concentration, this is the most important, because this is what actually takes this last factor of the path, it moves it on so you can get to the goal. That's what the Buddha's whole purpose was in having this image as a path. It's going someplace. We don't practice for the sake of right view or for the sake of right concentration. We use these things as steps toward the goal, which is the deathless, total freedom from suffering and stress. This is what makes everything else in the path worthwhile. The Buddha doesn't talk much about the goal, because after all, it's not something you can create. He talks about it just enough to make you realize it's the ultimate happiness, the ultimate freedom. And it's totally outside of any location in space or in time, physical or mental. And he says, if you have any perception that the goal might be accompanied by any kind of suffering, okay, if that's a wrong perception. And it's a goal that solves all your other problems. That's where this path is going. And it's the right path, and right view is right view, and right resolve is right view, and all the way down the line, because they get you there. Not because the Buddha said they were right, but because they actually work. He discovered that they were right. The path is noble is because it takes you to a, a goal that is noble. Something that's not touched by aging, illness, or death. As the Buddha said, there are two kinds of search. There's a search for happiness and things that can age, grow ill, and die. That's the ignoble search. And then there's the noble search, which is for things that lie beyond aging, illness, and death. And when the goal is noble, that's what makes the path noble. And when you put all the factors together, you become a noble person. But at that point, you don't really care whether you're a noble person or not. You found something that's even more valuable than trying to figure out whether who you are or what you are. And John Swat had a nice comment on this. He said that the whole issue of self and not self becomes totally irrelevant at that point. You use the perception of not self to get there, but once you got there, you've got the ultimate happiness. And at that point, you don't worry about who's experiencing or if there's nobody there experiencing, because the experience is there. And that's all you need. <laughs>